Sometimes I felt like a coach of a junior hockey league team where you have 100 parents who everyone wants to have their son playing in the opening composition. I, I think the only way is that you, you have to maintain your own line. You, you can't give any favors to anybody. When you think of any peacemaking exercise, at certain states, you are not trusted by one party. Soon you find that you are not trusted by the other party. You find very often that you are not trusted by anybody. What decisions I have made, I have never gone back to those because it doesn't help. You have to look for future, you have to look at the present and try to see that you make the best decisions now uh, and, and make the best job that is humanly possible because that's all what people can ask me and, and anybody else who is doing this sort of work. And what was important, even if our trip to Belgrade was delayed somewhat, that we could present a united front. We could carry, as I describe it, a peace offer to Yugoslavia and its people. Actually, a document that would start a new beginning, which would take a long time, as everyone understood, but would be a new beginning. If I think of my childhood, I think perhaps the most dominant feature in that was that I felt that we were always on the move. I have very often tried to describe myself what I actually am. And perhaps the best description would be to say that I'm a permanently displaced person. But of course, whether you are a displaced person in your own country or refugee, the features are similar. Perhaps the original history of, in my life gave me a capability to make home wherever I was. So I have never felt rootless. I'm home where I am. I decided that all of a sudden that when I was in, in Stockholm, I should go and see what sort of work was available. And I met Sixten Hepling, who was the secretary general of that organization, which had a marvelous 60s name, Central Committee for Swedish Technical Assistant. Sounded very, very 60s. It was like a Peace Corps or volunteer type of program. And 
but it gave me a chance actually to make what I wanted out of that job. My experience in Pakistan was extremely important because I had time to study what worked, what didn't work. And I enjoyed it thoroughly because that was very innovative work. I helped them to prepare their classes and, and how, how to carry out the teaching. It was a learning process for all of us. To try to create conditions for sustainable development is perhaps the most challenging task. We need, for instance, education. We need education of, 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 of not only boys, but girls also. And I think it's a basic human rights that there's a gender equality that both men and women have a chance to, to be properly educated. Perhaps that decided what my career was going to be, because there was no choice anymore going back to where, where I had started. extremely interesting time and, and my appointment reflected the policy of my government at the time that they wanted to send people who knew something about the developmental issues to countries where we had a major developmental program. There's no way denying Tanzania is like your first love affair. It is, it has been, and it will always be an important part of my life. When we were in Tanzania, I had to deal with the Liberation Committee, and that included the Namibian Liberation Movement Swapo. And one day when the UN Commissioner for Namibia, uh, Sean McBride, wanted to retire, he came with a delegation of Swapo leadership and asked if I would become a Namibian candidate for, for Sean McBride's post in the UN. I, of course, consulted immediately my family and asked my wife, and she voted immediately in favor of moving to, to New York because New York was full of marvelous museums. And, and our son, who must have been six at the time, when he was consulted, he said, I have looked at the map, and I have come to the conclusion that Disney World is closer to New York than Dar es Salaam, so I vote in favor. often also meet a situation where you have two uneven partners. One government who has all the resources in the world, as it looks like. The other one who is strobing without not the necessary expertise often. 
And sometimes I'm faced with a question from my colleagues who are in the same business as I am. But how do you balance this? How do you make it more even? This negotiating situation. I think as a mediator, I don't think you can artificially build up anybody in the negotiating situation. But it is important that whatever you negotiate, you have to be comfortable with that. You have to be able to live with the outcome of that negotiation and feel that it's a fair deal for both. And, and that's where the difficulty comes. I remember talking to a Nigerian friend of mine, Pete, Dr. Peter Ono, who was the Assistant Secretary General of the Organization of African Unity, a good friend of mine. At some stage, I was getting very edgy in New York. Nothing was happening. There was no hope in sight for, for, for Namibia. And I talked to Peter and I said, Peter, I want to go back home. I'm wasting my best years here. He said, sit down, Marty, and, and look, it's a hard fact of life that you are not going anywhere. It's better to have a devil we know. So I decided that I'm not leaving New York before Namibia gets its independence. And it took me 13 years from beginning of 77 to, to 1990. Kaikki tuntuu olevan sitä mieltä, että tässä on nyt todellinen mahdollisuus. Ja se on kovin rohkaisevaa. Mä aivan muutamia päiviä sitten näin Svapon presidentti Nujoman kommentti, jossa hänkin toteaa, että Etelä-Afrika tuntuu olevan vakavissa. Nämä on semmoisia kommentteja, joita me emme ole todella kuulleet.